Call to Action is a local chapter. It's been around for 15 years or longer. Uh, the first one is called by the bishops uh, to mobilize the laity. The, mobile, uh, the laity actually took the call and got mobilized, and the bishops started uh, distancing themselves and eventually condemned us and uh, will not permit us to meet in Catholic property. So that's why we're here at uh, Gloria de Luther. Can I get a witness from the congregation? You're mocking me, aren't you? Well, hello, fellow Catholics out there in internet land. My name is Ephraim Cortez, and once again, you're tuned in to Cafeteria Catholics, the show for Cafeteria Catholics, not by Cafeteria Catholics. And we are coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky, via Spreaker and iHeart Radio, the state of the art in internet communications and what's going on fellow catholics great to be behind the cafeteria catholics microphone once again as you know i am your humble host your tired humble host <laughs> Ephraim cortez i've been awake since 5 30 this morning fellow catholics doing research on this show working on this show preparing for the show it's not as easy as i make it sound behind the cafeteria catholics microphone fellow catholics a lot of work goes into it Okay, but been up since uh, 5.30 in the morning. It is now 6.01 in the afternoon on a Saturday in Lexington, Kentucky, fellow Catholics. And so, a little tired, but worth it, fellow Catholics. It is worth it. I am excited about this show. And by the way, before we even get started, I've got to give props i got to do something out of the ordinary here, fellow Catholics. I've got to give props to the local Catholic radio station in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And I know we give these guys a hard time here on Cafeteria Catholics because local Catholic radio tends to ignore issues of importance, I believe, to local Catholics here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. Issues that affect the faith of local Catholics in the Catholic Church here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And so I take issue sometimes with, with these guys. But, hey, nevertheless, props are due. And so specifically, I need to give props to Mike Allen of the Mike Allen Radio Show because he actually addressed the issue that we are going to be tackling here on Cafeteria Catholics. I was shocked fellow Catholics, pleasantly shocked that they actually took up the issue. Did not go ignored, fellow Catholics. It's a good thing. And so props are due. And so all kinds of props over there to local Catholic radio, to Mike Allen, the Mike Allen radio show. And if you happen to be a member of the Lexington, Kentucky Diocese, you probably know what it is that I'm talking about, right? You have probably guessed what issue it is that I am talking about. And so if you heard Mike Allen speak about this issue yesterday on his radio show, do not tune away, fellow Catholics, because you have not heard an issue addressed until you have heard it addressed here at a Cafeteria Catholics. We give it the full treatment here on Cafeteria Catholics. So do not tune away. We have audio. We have exclusive audio here on Cafeteria Catholics. As I said, I've been awake since 5.30 in the morning working on this show. And part of the, the reason why is because I've been looking all over the internet for audio. And this person of whom I speak, the culprit in all of this, okay, whom Mike Allen spoke about yesterday on his show the culprit is on a down low this person operates on a down low and it was hard 
Donald Catholics to find audio on this person. But we have a crack research team here on Cafeteria Catholics. And by crack, I don't mean the crack that Pope Obama puts on his pie over there at the White House and feeds his, <laughs> feeds his family over there. Okay? By crack, I mean efficient, on the ball. Okay? A crack research team, and that team just happens to be me. <laughs> I wish I had a team, but unfortunately, I do it all here at a cafeteria Catholics, okay? And I've been awake since, I, uh, like I said, since 5.30 this morning, working on this show, and it was worth it, fellow Catholics. So stay tuned, stay tuned. Okay. And by the way, in case you didn't already know, we are all over the internet. Let us know whether you like the show, whether you hate the show, whether you love the show. An easy way of doing that, fellow Catholics, is email cafeteriacatholicsyahoo.com. And so, Cafeteria Catholics is ahead of the curb, fellow Catholics. This is why you listen to Cafeteria Catholics, because we are ahead of the curb. And you've heard us talk about call to action. This group of heretical, can't call them Catholics, they're not a Catholic, so you can't be heretical and Catholic at the same time. You can't be both and. You can't adhere to the teaching of the Catholic Church and yet at the same time reject the teaching of the Catholic Church. And so, can't call them heretical Catholics. No such thing. They are heretics, right? Call to action. And you've heard us talk about this group before, but let's hear it from the horse's mouth. At the top of the show, you heard a clip from a call to action member. So let's hear it from the horse's mouth as he gives a history of call to action. Call to action is a local chapter. It's been around for 15 years or longer. Uh, the first one is called by the bishops uh, to mobilize the laity. The, mobile, uh, the laity actually took the call and got mobilized, and the bishops started uh, distancing themselves and eventually condemned us and uh, will not permit us to meet. In Red flag, fellow Catholics, right? Red flag. The bishops condemned call to action. But why would the bishops condemn a group that was called into existence by them. It was the bishops who called this group into existence. And yet, according to a member of Call to Action, they have been condemned by these very bishops. Why is that? It is because Call to Action reject church doctrine. They are heretics. They reject the teaching of the Catholic Church when it comes to homosexuality, fellow Catholics. When it comes to sodomy, they reject the teaching of the Catholic Church. And we know that the teaching of the Catholic Church teaches against homosexuality. It teaches against sodomy. We know this, right? And yet, call to action, they accept they advance the idea of homosexuality, sodomy, even within the clergy, fellow Catholics, even within the clergy. And we've seen firsthand, right? Firsthand, we've seen what homosexuality within the clergy has done to Holy Mother Church, right? We are still suffering the effects of the homosexual sex abuse scandal that has rocked the Catholic Church. Still feeling the effects of it, and yet this group of heretics advance the idea, openly advance the idea of homosexuality, sodomy, within the clergy. And they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. They, they are not the only heretical group out there that tries to pass itself off as Catholics and instead are wreaking havoc in the Catholic pew. Okay? They are not the only ones. You've got Future Church out there. You've got Women's Ordination Conference. 
You've got Pax Christi USA, Dignity USA, all working within Holy Mother Church, wreaking havoc within the walls of Holy Mother Church, pretending to be Catholic and yet are not, advancing alien ideas, foreign ideas, to the teaching of the Catholic Church. But call to action, they are the mother of all heretical groups. All of these other groups, Future Church, uh, Pax Christi USA, all the rest of them, they are splinters of call to action. They have splintered from call to action. And so call to action is the mother of all heretical groups within Holy Mother Church. And the fuel that drives call to action, the fuel that drives this heretical movement, is the ordination of women. This is their goal. This is their primary goal, is the ordination of women. And they do it all under the banner of social justice. And this is no social justice at all. It is social injustice is what it is, right? Because it is an injustice upon Holy Mother Church, an injustice upon her teaching, an injustice upon members, lay members especially, of the Catholic Church being misled by these people, by call to action. But this is the fuel that drives call to action. Women's ordination. This is what it's all about for them. This is their primary goal. The ordination of women. In spite of the fact that this is an alien teaching. A foreign teaching. To the teaching of the Catholic Church. It is in comparison complete contrast to the teaching of the Catholic Church. We are told by the Catechism of the Catholic Church that ordination, in order for ordination to be valid, you have to have a baptized male, not a baptized female, a baptized male. It is necessary. You cannot replace it with some other element. These people, I think, maybe, maybe not, fail to see that ordination is a sacrament. It is a sacrament of the Catholic Church. And like all sacraments of the Catholic Church, there is a certain recipe that is required in order for a sacrament to be valid. In the sacrament of holy matrimony, you have to have a male and a female. Cannot replace the male with a female or the female with a male. In other words, you can't have uh, the same genders in the recipe of, of, of holy matrimony. Okay, Every sacrament has a recipe that has to be followed, has to be adhered to, in order for that sacrament to be valid. You have to have unleavened bread for the sacrament of the Eucharist. Can't replace it with a Ritz cracker. You have to have unleavened bread. This is the recipe that was handed down to the Catholic Church by Jesus Christ himself, the ultimate chef. You know, I often like to use the example of chocolate chip cookies. Everybody loves chocolate chip cookies, right? Well, there is a certain recipe that is required in order for chocolate chip cookies to be made, right? In order for one to make chocolate chip cookies, you have to have the main ingredient. And what is the main ingredient? Chocolate chips. You can't replace chocolate chips with peanut butter. If you do, then you can't call those cookies chocolate chip cookies. They are something other than chocolate chip cookies. Because you've replaced the main ingredient, the chocolate chips. Same holds true for the sacrament of ordination. 
there is a certain recipe that was handed down to the Catholic Church by Jesus Christ himself. And that recipe requires a baptized male. And beyond all that, fellow Catholics, on its face, it is silly. It is a joke, fellow Catholics, to think that a woman could be ordained to the priesthood. Right? Think about it this way. A male, let's say a man, let's say you know a good Catholic man. He's always at church. Always the first one in the church, last one out. Stays after Mass and says a prayer of thanksgiving. Takes part in church functions and activities, right? A good Catholic man. Let's say that this good Catholic man comes to you and he says, You know what? I have a desire to serve Holy Mother Church on a higher plane, on a higher capacity. And so I think, uh, I think that I'm being called to the convent. I think I, I'm being called to serve as a nun, a Catholic man. saying, telling you that he wants to be a nun. This is a joke, right? Because instinctively we know that the call to the convent is a supernatural call that belongs to a woman, not to a man. Granted, there's no ordination required, but nevertheless, it is a supernatural call that belongs to a woman, not to a man. And in the same manner, the call to the priesthood is a supernatural call that belongs to a man, not to a woman. And yet, these women are actually taken seriously by many Catholics. By many Catholics, not just by the culture, not just by the mainstream media, not just by CNN, who jumps at the chance, MSNBC, they jump at the chance... To place a woman before the camera, a Catholic woman before the camera, who desires, she says, to be a priest, who says she is called to the priesthood by the spirit of Vatican II. <laughs> Nonetheless, right? By the spirit of Vatican II. Not by the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of Vatican II calls her to the priesthood. CNN, they jump at the chance, right? MSNBC, they jump at the chance to place a camera before such a woman. They are taken seriously, even by Catholics, because we as Catholics, we've been beaten over the head with the idea that the priesthood should belong to a woman, as if they had a right to the priesthood. It is a supernatural call, just as the convent is a supernatural call that belongs to a woman, not to a man. And if a man came forward, a Catholic man came forward and said that he was called to the convent, wants to be a nun, he'd be laughed out of the room, right? But yet you don't see men, you don't see men on TV. I'm willing to bet that you've never had a man, a Catholic man, come to you and say, you know, I think I'm called to be a nun. You've never heard that, have you? You've never heard a man cry out against the uh, act of discrimination against him by the Catholic Church because he will not be accepted into the convent. And we think that's ridiculous. We think it's, uh, you know, we get a good laugh out of that. But yet, women are taken seriously. Catholic women are taken seriously when they demand ordination. They demand it, fellow Catholics. They don't ask to uh, uh, go to the seminary first, at least. That doesn't even cross their mind. They just want to be ordained right then and there, right? 
as if they had some kind of right to the priesthood. You know, you won't even see a gay man expressing a desire to join the convent. You just don't see that, do you? But yet, these call-to-action women, these women from all of these other heretical movements, this is what they want. They want ordination. Ordination. They, de they demand it. And so what's the point? What's the point of all this uh, bringing up call-to-action? Why bring it up? Well, fellow Catholics, we happen to have a Catholic biblical scholar here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, who has, well, at one point she taught in Catholic school here in the Diocese of Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. She taught for 14 years, taught in our Catholic school here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. Fourteen years, okay? She goes by the name of Margaret Ralph, okay? And my wife actually was taught by this woman, okay? And my, my wife was actually, let's believe, as a young Catholic girl, that a lot of the stories in the Gospels were actually allegorical. Didn't actually happen. They were myths. Didn't actually happen. They were allegorical. Okay? So, this biblical scholar, Margaret Ralph, here's a story from the National Catholic Reporter. Okay? It says, uh, let's see if I have it over here. Here it is. It says, a religious educator with decades of experience hired to write scripture commentaries for a liturgy training source book had her writing pulled from the book after the publisher learned that she had presented a workshop at a call-to-action conference. So Margaret Ralph, a biblical scholar here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, who has misled many Catholics throughout the years in this diocese gives a talk at a call-to-action conference. And what is this group about once again? Call to Action is a local chapter. It's been around for 15 years or longer. Uh, the first one is called by the bishops uh, to mobilize the laity. The, mobile, uh, the laity actually took the call and got mobilized and the bishops started uh, distancing themselves and eventually condemned us and uh, will not permit us to meet in Catholic property. So that's why we're here at uh, Gloria Day. So Margaret Ralph gives a talk at a conference for a group for a group that has been condemned by the bishops. And yet, she sees nothing wrong with it. Right? In that same article, here we have, uh, it says, uh, she told NCR, National Catholic Reporter, that she and her audience discussed De Vermum, a Second Vatican Council document that focuses on Scripture and divine revelation, homosexuality, and contraception. They also spent a very short time on women's ordination, she said. And so she is dismissed. They do not want her writings in this biblical source book. And she complains about it. She complains about it to NCR, National Ca to the National Catholic Reporter. She complains about it. She talks about this priest that contacted her and let her know your writings are being pulled and she says he kept bringing up women's ordination over and over and over and I said my talk was about being a biblical contextualist it wasn't about challenging the church on women's ordination okay so being a biblical contextualist okay this is what this is what the talk was about 
okay? And incidentally, she gave the same talk at the Newman Center here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And here is a summary of that talk. Okay, we are told... And you can find this on cvents.com. Zvents, letter Z, vents, okay, V E N T S, cvents.com. You can find this summary of the talk. It says, The Catholic Church teaches us to be nourished and ruled by Scripture. The Catholic Church also teaches us to be contextualists, to put the authority of Scripture behind the intent of the inspired author. In this talk, we will review the contextualist approach to Scripture and then ask if we are being nourished and ruled by Scripture in regard to issues such as homosexuality and women's ordination. This is the fuel that drives call to action. Women's ordination and homosexuality, right? And this is a talk that was given at the Newman Center by Margaret Ralph. And so she complains about, oh, we didn't. And she admits, she admits that they did talk for a short time, she says, about women's ordination at the Call to Action Conference, right? And that same talk was given at the Newman Center here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And according to that summary, uh, it says, uh, In this talk we will review the contextualist approach to Scripture and then ask if we are being nourished and ruled by Scripture in regard to issues such as homosexuality and women's ordination. So, the talk was going to deal with women's ordination and with homosexuality. And so, she says that, you know, women's ordination is not something that she, uh, let's see how she words it. Uh, and I said my talk was about being a biblical contextualist. It wasn't about challenging the church on women's ordination. So she doesn't challenge the church on women's ordination, but she goes around talking about it publicly to anyone who will listen, right? This is what her talk was about at the uh, Newman Center. According to this summary, in this talk, we will review the contextualist approach to Scripture and then ask if we are being nourished and ruled by Scripture in regard to issues such as homosexuality and women's ordination. Okay, Newman Foundation Incorporated. Distinguished speaker, Dr. Margaret Ralph, nourished and ruled by Scripture. Okay, that's her talk. And so here we have this biblical scholar in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, at the Newman Center, okay, at the Newman Center, Catholic parish here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, giving essentially the same talk that was perhaps given at this call to action conference. And you know, the Newman Center, or this distinguished, uh, distinguished speakers series, I've written m many articles in the past about this, this, this series of speakers, okay? Many of them are heretical speakers, call-to-action speakers. Father John Deere, there just happens to be an article on him that I wrote on uh, uh, www.againstallheresies.webs.com if you want to take a look at it, okay? It's an article that I wrote back in 2010 when John Deere, who also happens to be a call-to-action speaker, spoke at the Newman Center under the Distinguished Speakers Series. Okay? And there, there is a long list of heretics that have spoken at the Newman Center here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. This is why I say all things are not fine and dandy here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. Much havoc has been wreaked upon the laity in this diocese. 
by Margaret Ralph and others. And when, when we get back, fellow Catholics, I will have some clips of the uh, lunacy that is uh, taught by Margaret Ralph. Okay? So, stay tuned, fellow Catholics. We will see you on the other side. Please do not touch that mouse. There's a way of life where simplicity brings joy and humility leads to happiness. Where we learn that less is more and in giving we receive. It's our refuge from chaos and light to guide us through darkness. It's a place where the broken receive healing and repentant hearts find mercy. Here, our days are set free from anxiety and addictions and our nights rest with more peace. So, where is this hope, and who knows the way? Our hope rests in Jesus, and His Church leads the way. If you're longing to fill an emptiness, or seeking a way home, we invite you to experience the peace that only comes from God. We are Catholic. Welcome home. It was the night of the Last Supper. Jesus knew the time had come for Him to leave the world. Yet he wanted to remain with us, just as personally as if he had never left. How did he accomplish this? By instituting the priesthood. From generation to generation, he would handpick men to minister in his person. St. John Vianney said, If we were to fully realize what a priest is on earth, we would die, not of fright, but of love. Is this really how we view our priests? Even though priests are human and imperfect, they bring us the sacraments, including the forgiveness of sins. It is through the office of the priesthood that Christ accomplishes his saving work. How can we not then pray for our priests, affirm them, and lift them up? St. Vianney said, What use would be a house filled with gold were there no one to open its door? The priest holds the key to the treasures of heaven. It is he who opens the door. who is dark and ancient and divine within us, who is the so source of non What's going on, fellow Catholics? You're listening to Cafeteria Catholics, and that right there, fellow Catholics, is a mass, a so-called mass, being, I don't know, performed by women who claim to be priests at a call-to-action conference, fellow Catholics. The same kind of conference that was attended by Margaret Ralph, where she gave a talk on scriptural contextualism. Okay? Uh, let's take a listen to that again. Does that sound anything like a Catholic Mass to you, fellow Catholics? Let's take a little listen there. Wisdom, Sophia. We fail you when we refuse to dismantle the inherent racism and white privilege in this struggle for women's ordination. Wisdom Sophia, have mercy. You see, these people, they don't pray to Jesus Christ at the Mass. This is not how they celebrate Mass. They pray to the Goddess Sophia, whom they call Wisdom Sophia. This is what goes on at a call to action. And Margaret Ralph accepted an invitation. Which, by the way, why would a call to action invite Margaret Ralph to speak at their conference unless they uh, didn't see some form of solidarity between the two? Between call to action and the beliefs of call to action and Margaret Ralph and her scriptural contextualism. Okay? She claims to be a, a biblical contextualist. 
And it sounds good on the surface, right? Because it sounds like, hey, I read scripture in context, not out of context, as some of our Protestant brothers and sisters do. Right? They like to pull a verse out of scripture and use that as proof that you know that the Catholic Church is doing something wrong, right? Call no man father. They love that one. Jesus says, call no man father. But yet, in the same gospel of Luke, we have Jesus calling Abraham father, right? So they take a verse out of context to try and prove that the Catholic Church is a uh, anti-scriptural, that we are doing things as Catholics that we should not be doing because Jesus says you should not do them. Call no man father. And yet Jesus himself calls Abraham father. Right? But anyway, the point is, scripture should not be taken out of context. And so when you hear the term biblical contextualist, you know, it sounds, it sounds like it's something good. Don't take scripture out of context. But the fact of the matter is, is that we should read scripture as Catholics, not only as contextualists, because we should not take scripture out of context, but we should also at times read it literally. You know, there's a fine line there in the contextualist approach that is taken by Margaret Ralph and other scripture scholars. Right? And that is that uh, uh, certain things get lost. There are certain things that they consider to be allegorical rather than uh, 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 true stories in the Bible. Right? And this is part of what Margaret Ralph speaks about here in this clip. And this is a clip from a talk that Margaret Ralph gave. at Boston University. It's not from Call to Action. It's a talk that she gave at Boston University on the Eucharist. And this is part of what she had to say. And I had to dig deep for this audio, fellow Catholics, because as I said, Margaret Ralph, she seems to operate underground. You know what I'm saying? It's hard very hard to find any audio or video of her teachings. I mean, I guess you can buy her books, right? But that's not going to do me any good here on Cafeteria Catholics. But anyway, finally I found a talk on the Boston University website. And if anyone would like a copy of the complete talk, I can either post it on Facebook or I can email it to you as an mp3 file, okay? But anyway, here is this clip. This is Margaret Ralph teaching on the Eucharist and actually teaching on the Gospel of John, okay? Take a listen, fellow Catholics. John is. John has no infancy narrative. He has no story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He has no Passover Last Supper where Jesus institutes Eucharist. But he emphasizes Eucharist just as much as Luke. And he does it by having allegorical stories that appear to be about Jesus' public ministry, but in fact are about the presence of the risen Christ in the community to whom John is writing. Okay. So, the Gospel of John contains allegorical stories. In other words, stories that didn't actually happen. You know, they didn't happen. But, John is creating these stories. He is creating these stories for the benefit of those who are living at the time and whom or to whom he is writing to at the time because they are awaiting Jesus Christ. They are expecting Jesus Christ to come back in his glory and this is just not happening, right? And so these people are getting nervous 
And they want to know, where is Jesus Christ? And so, John, he had to do something about this, right? And so, he made up some stories, some allegorical stories to relate to the community at the time, the Christian community at the time, that Jesus Christ had indeed come back. Eucharistically, but not in the way in which we see the Eucharist, right? But he had come back. And so these allegorical stories are related by John in order to confirm that Jesus Christ did indeed come back. So let's hear that again. John is. John has no infancy narrative. He has no story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He has no Passover Last Supper where Jesus institutes Eucharist. But he emphasizes Eucharist just as much as Luke. And he does it by having allegorical stories that appear to be about Jesus' public ministry, but in fact are about the presence of the risen Christ in the community to whom John is writing, which is the end of the century community who is asking, where is the risen Christ? He was supposed to return in glory long before now. And you know that expectation that Jesus would return in the generation of the people who witnessed his death was is obvious in the letters, in Paul's letters, in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay. So where is he? John is writing his gospel to teach that the risen Christ did return. He returned in his post-resurrection appearances, and he has never left he remains with his people through the church and through the sacraments. And so the mighty signs in John's gospel are allegories about the ways in which the risen Christ is present. So the mighty signs, fellow Catholics, in other words, the miracles in John's gospels are allegories. Myths, they never actually happened, right? This is what an allegory is. It is a myth. As a matter of fact, let's go. <clears throat> let's uh, look up really quick here. Okay, let's go to dictionary.com. Dictionary.com. And let's look up synonyms for the word allegory. And see what we get, fellow Catholics, okay? Here we are. Dictionary.com. Let's type in the word allegory. Oops. Here we go. Allegory. I'm a slow typist, uh, typist, fellow, typist, fellow Catholics, okay? Remember, I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> Barely speak. But here we go. Allegory. Synonyms. Or allegory. Story. Myth. Tale. Fable. Symbolism. Right? And so, John, the Gospel of John is filled with allegorical stories. These signs, these mighty signs that are depicted in the Gospel of John are just allegories. They never really happened. They were made up by the Gospel writer, by John. The disciple John made it up. I'm often accused of making things up. <clears throat> well, I bet she is, but I don't know about John, the disciple. Here, let me take a drink of water, fellow Catholics. So John made it up, see? So this is the problem with contextualist biblical scholars. Is that they get to pick and choose sometimes what is to be taken as, as true, as true accounts in the Bible... 
And what is allegorical? And here she is speaking about the Gospel of John. You know, the birth narrative of John in or, uh, the birth narrative of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke. This is what she has to say about that account. Nothing. So, what we have here is a situation in which the shepherds recognize who this infant is. And he's placed in the manger because the manger is where you put the food for the flock. It's a feeding trough. So Luke teaches that Jesus is present in Eucharist and feeds the flock, both in his infancy narrative, in his Last Supper narrative, and in his post-resurrection narrative. Now, we're all... So she's right about all that, okay? She is right about all that. The reason why I played that clip is because she accepts the account in Luke of the birth narrative. She accepts that as actually happening. You know, it actually took place. But in the Gospel of John, all of these stories are allegorical stories. They never happened. So, who has given Margaret Ralph the authority to declare that the Gospel of John is allegorical, the mighty signs in the Gospel of John are allegorical, but yet the Gospel of Luke is to be taken literally. It actually happened. Right? How do you do that? Right? How do you say, well, this over here is allegorical, but over on this side, this gospel, we should accept that. Right? It sounds like a Luther approach to the gospels. Right? Luther, he wanted to get rid of some of the books in the Bible, he wanted to get rid of the book of Revelation and so forth. Right? So, uh, why not just do that? If it's allegorical, it doesn't really mean anything, right? There's no point to it. So let's just get rid of it, right? And do you know what is one of the stories, if you listen to the entire talk, okay? Uh, one of the stories that she considers to be allegorical is the bread of life discourse. John chapter 6 where Jesus speaks about the Eucharist. Speaks about the Eucharist and says, you know, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That was allegorical. Never actually happened. It was made up by John. I'm often accused of making things up. <laughs> I bet you are, right? But that's allegorical. So this is the problem with contextualist, contextualist, I can't even say it, fellow Catholics, contextualist, that should be a red flag right there. If you can't say it, <laughs> contextualist biblical scholarship, right? Actual events actually get lost in there, you know? Uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. This is from the Gospel of John. Is that a allegorical? I think we need to ask uh, Margaret Ralph that question, right? I'm often accused of making things up. <laughs> and you know, yesterday when Mike Allen was talking about this on his show, The Mike Allen Show, he uh, started off by saying, you know, going to be charitable, right? Need to, need to exercise some charity here. And I'm going to be charitable about it. Well, tell you what, Mike. I'm going to be as charitable as this woman has been to Catholics in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, for more than a decade. That's how charitable I'm going to be towards her. As charitable as she has been with the teaching of the Catholic Church, this is how charitable I will be. Okay, Because this is heresy. This is what it is. It is heresy that is being taught by this woman, that has been taught by this woman. My wife 
was taught by this woman in Catholic school here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And my wife came out of Catholic school confused, not knowing what to believe. My wife actually thought that some of the stuff in the Bible was allegorical, because this is what she was taught. And you know, some stuff in the uh, in a uh, scripture cannot be taken cannot be taken literally. You know, you have the account of creation. You know, it took seven days for God to create heaven and earth. Well, God does not operate in time, right? So how could it take God time to create heaven and earth? He is a pure spirit. He operates in eternity. And so some things we are not to take literally in the Bible. Right? The number seven, we have no idea how long it took uh, God to create heaven and earth. More than likely, he just thought it into existence. Right? He is omnipotent. He is the all-knowing God. He operates in eternity, not in time. And so... Days, minutes, weeks do not apply to God. And so in the book of creation, when you see seven, you know, biblically speaking, seven stands for perfection, right? It means perfection. And so could mean that, uh, 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 you know, everything as was created in the beginning was perfect. It was completely perfect, right? And at the same time, it could simply be the author trying to relate a supernatural story in a way in which we, with our limited human, bo- human minds, could comprehend, right? Because who can comprehend eternity and how God operates in eternity? We can't, because we are constrained by time, by body parts, as I've said on the show before, right? And so time does not apply to, 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 to God, doesn't apply to... Uh, Jesus Christ in his divine nature doesn't apply to him, right? Doesn't apply to the Holy Spirit, right? And so, you know, you have to, to, to understand sometimes that certain things are allegorical, as she says. But the bread of life discourse, <laughs> that's allegorical. The raising of Lazarus from the dead, that's allegorical. This is not what the church teaches, fellow Catholics. The church understands the raising of Lazarus to be an actual event that actually took place. Okay? But this is the type of thing that is being taught by this woman to this day, fellow Catholics. To this day, she is going around the country and teaching this kind of a heresy. And so it's only fitting that she would give a speech at call to action. It's only fitting, fellow Catholics. Okay? Because she herself ascribes to the heresy that is taught by uh, call to action and other such heretical groups throughout this country. Okay, and Margaret Ralph, okay, Bishop Gaynor, our former bishop, who has gone back to Philadelphia, okay, our former bishop, one of the first things that he did as bishop in this diocese was that he fired four women. Okay, he fired Pastoral Services Director at the time, Sister Helen Mayer Garvey. Parish Leadership Director at the time, Sister Elizabeth Wendelin. And Ministry Formation Director at the time, Sister Iris Ann Letton. Fired them. Another one in that group was Margaret Ralph. Okay? And these women, according to a Herald Leader article at the time, okay, a member of the Catholic Church here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, was quoted by the Herald Leader as saying the following, they are people 
meaning the four women who got fired, they are people, this includes Margaret, Margaret Ralph, they are people who have been outspoken, and they are people who have been more liberal, and they are people who have put together the new faces of ministry. Now, I don't know if I've ever spoken about the new faces of ministry here on Cafeteria Catholics, but New Faces of Ministry was basically a program that was concocted by radical feminist nuns in this diocese. By radical feminist nuns, I I mean Sister Helen Mayer Garvey, Sister Elizabeth Wendelin, and Sister Iris Ann Letton, all of whom were fired by the former bishop, Bishop Ronald W. Gaynor. One of the first things he did as bishop in this diocese was to fire these women. And they concocted the new faces of ministry whose goal was to ordain women in this diocese, fellow Catholics. As a matter of fact, an article from the Crossroads, which is the diocesan newspaper, okay, uh, stated the following, okay, and this is actually from a, a, a an article that I wrote in a website that I operated at the time, but it says, in fact, reports that were published in the December 28th, 1997 issue of the Crossroads showed that all five regions of the Lexington Diocese who attended the New Faces of Ministry meetings specifically called for the ordination of women. Okay, and this is from the Crossroads. Okay, this is a quote from the Crossroads. This is the Mountain East region We believe there needs to be increased lay leadership and a commitment to a broader understanding of ordination. Ordination is fundamentally the faith community calling forth its leaders and should be open to all with appropriate training and deep spirituality, including married men and women. Okay, I'll give you just one more region of the Lexington Diocese at the time, okay? And this is a... uh, Let's see. This is the Fayette region, which is the region in which I live. Okay, the Fayette region. Ordination of women, married man, provides a necessary response to ministry concerns. And so, Margaret Ralph, according to this Herald Leader article, was behind New Faces of Ministry, which sought the ordination of women. And yet, in this NCR article, National Catholic Reporter article, she says, It wasn't about challenging the church on women's ordination. She says her talk at a call to action was not about challenging the church to women's ordination. And yet, this is perhaps the same talk that she gave at the Newman Center here in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky, fellow Catholics. And in a summary, which I read earlier, in a summary that I found on cvents.com, it states, The Catholic Church teaches us to be, and this is a summary of the talk which she gave, or was about to give, at the Newman Center. It says, The Catholic Church teaches us to be nourished and ruled by Scripture. Let's skip down to the bottom. In this talk, we will review the contextualist approach to Scripture, and then ask if we are being nourished and ruled by Scripture in regard to issues such as homosexuality, and women's ordination. And so women's ordination was going to be discussed by Margaret Ralph. One of the women who, according to the Herald Leader newspaper here in in uh, Kentucky, in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, she was one of the women who came up with new phases of ministry, whose goal was to eventually ordain women, fellow Catholics. 
okay and this is a this is a program that was actually in violation of canon law it was in violation of canon 515 a parish is entrusted to a parish priest Canon 519, the parish priest is the proper pastor of the parish entrusted to him. Canon 532, the priest acts in the person of the parish. And Canon 521, Section 1, to be validly appointed a parish priest, one must be in the second order of the priesthood. Fellow Catholics. Okay, this is Margaret Ralph. This is a woman who has wreaked havoc in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky for many, many years, fellow Catholics. Okay? And now she wants to go out and deny what she is all about. She wants to deny it. Okay? Uh, she says, uh, speaking about the priest who informed her that her Scripture commentaries were going to be pulled from this biblical source book. She says, he kept bringing up women's ordination over and over and over. And I said, my talk was about being a biblical contextualist. It wasn't about challenging the church on women's ordination. He just felt that my name shouldn't be associated with any publication that was diocesan-sponsored because it would make the diocese appear weak on doctrine. Okay, is Margaret Ralph weak on doctrine, fellow Catholics? John is. John has no infancy narrative. He has no story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He has no Passover Last Supper where Jesus institutes Eucharist. But he emphasizes Eucharist just as much as Luke. And he does it by having allegorical stories that appear to be about Jesus' public ministry, but in fact are about the presence of the risen Christ in the community to whom John is writing. You tell me, fellow Catholics. You tell me. Anyway, let's go ahead and leave it there, fellow Catholics. And I meant to talk a little bit about o about Obama, but hey, the show is what the show is, I guess. And uh, this is how it turned out, fellow Catholics. So we will see you next time, fellow Catholics. Please pray for our diocese, especially as uh, our Pope, Pope Francis, takes on the task of appointing a new bishop to the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And I hope, let's pray, fellow Catholics, that it is a good Catholic bishop who adheres to the teaching of the Catholic Church because wolves, fellow Catholics, wolves are lying in the wait in this diocese. So please pray for this diocese. Please pray for our Pope. Please pray for our bishops. And please pray for this great country of ours, fellow Catholics. As you know, this great country of ours is in dire need of prayer. So please, pray. Thought I'd like to be in an office. I'm often accused of making Thought things up. Thought that I might make it on my own. I'm often accused of making things up. Until I find myself one morning Penniless with no place to call home